my own presentation will address my deployment to the Middle East. My travel was to the near part of the Middle East, um, by which I'm in Egypt, Israel, the West Bank, and uh, I had made a proposal to look at unseen aspects of the war on terror through lens-based media and non-fiction writing. So my writing has, has featured in a number of, uh, of publications, the Diabolique catalog, for instance, um, the, the journal on site, and a feature on war. But for the presentation right now, I'm going to focus mostly on the, uh, on the visual quotient. So, here we have a view of the 1973 war panorama in Cairo. Um, there's a lot of public art within and around Egypt. And I, when I was offered the opportunity to travel to the near part of the Middle East, it was really because I had this sense that the war on terror although we understand it perhaps in a post 9-11 context, really has a percolation out of the Middle East to do with longer simmering conflicts with regards to religion, colonialization, and munitions or um, the smuggling of, of, of product through spaces and of course uh, the world of, of oil. So I'll take you through my journey first of all. Um, in wanting to look at the cultures on the ground, it was really important for me to visit not just one location. I wanted to be able to see territories from both sides of a particular conflict and understand from my writing how other countries represent their own conflict through military arts or uh, the art of war. So um, I was able to travel unaccompanied in both uh, Egypt and, and Israel for the non-military part of my research. So I hired guides, or we might call them fixers, to uh, be able to help me through particular locations. This is traveling through Egypt. We've seen a lot of pictures like this recently in terms of the infrastructure. It struck me immediately that there's a lot of haves and have-nots in this part of the world. And my travel then across through Ismailia and uh, the Suez and into Sinai was actually by taxi. So all of the images here that I'm showing you were shot uh, with a high-speed lens, uh, traveling at sometimes quite frighteningly speeds, uh, high speeds in the taxi. Um, the tenth of Ramadan city was not a place I was familiar with before getting there, but uh, the idea of um, religious identity clearly etched within into the landscape. For a lot of people, though, they're uh, really on a subsistence uh, level, and you could see at the side of the highway fruit stands and roadside stands uh, selling all sorts of uh, um, materials and goods. We have here a, a shepherd who is um, bringing the goats and the cattle down to actually water. This is a, um, a waterway. Um, the surface is a little blurred because of the speed that the vehicle was traveling at, but the garbage incident that Erin brought up was uh, really well indicated uh, with the flotsam and jetsam that you can see here. And I had um, not a lot of uh, liaison with the people on the ground before I traveled, so I didn't know exactly what I was gonna be seeing and experiencing, so I really needed to kind of uh, respond to the moment as I was traveling. Here uh, we have the Hosni Mubarak Peace Bridge across the Suez Canal. Similar to, to Erin um, in terms of what I could photograph and couldn't photograph, Egypt has very uh, strict laws on not photographing infrastructure, government buildings and so forth, but uh, I felt in a taxi at 170 kilometers an hour that I would take my chances. Military outposts, remnants from the October 1973 war, the Yom Kippur War. Here we have an Egyptian military outpost in the desert. Tank traps, uh, military defenses here. This, of course, is the site of uh, the largest tank battle in uh, modern history. But you can see for a lot of the locals, donkey cart travel, again, really exemplifies the difference between the haves and the have-nots. Bedouin culture, one of the aspects that really bridged both sides of a number of borders that I crossed. There were multiple military checkpoints that I had to travel through in the Sinai, and um, for Bedouins that consider themselves as a, as a nation without a nation, they don't have passports. They're um, highly mobile in a number of instances, hence the camels, but then the occasional splash of color here in the foreground, you can see the traditional Bedouin dwelling with the brushwood and then a, a, a slightly more substantive building in the background with this beautiful flora. In towns and villages, peppered uh, infrequently throughout the region, again, the garbage, the sanitation was a big issue. You can still see from the pockmarks in the buildings behind, evidence of, uh, of gunfire. 
Here I am on the road to Rafa. I was deployed with the Multinational Force and Observers, which is a little known international peacekeeping organization, 11 different countries, upwards of 2,000 troops that oversees the peace treaty between Egypt and Israel. It's nothing to do with the United Nations, it's nothing to do with NATO, and that's really why we don't hear about them very much. They're based out of Rome. I felt very fortunate to get the approval from Rome to be able to visit the base there. And um, it's located in the Egyptian side of the border, about 10 miles from Rafa on the Gaza Strip. So here I am now. This is the, the motif. I think it's kind of uh, pretty folksy, actually. The dove and the, uh, the olive branch, indicative of late 70s uh, culture, perhaps. It was put to me by one of the Canadians that this is perhaps the most successful Canadian peacekeeping mission in history. 28, 29 years, still um, no conflict uh, brewed between Egypt and Israel, but of course things are rapidly changing there as we speak. So I'm gonna show you some of the subsequent images for exhibition that I created from this visit to MFO North Camp. Similar to some of the other experiences that we've heard about, my situation did change once I got on base and I wasn't allowed to leave the base after I arrived there. But I did have free rain pretty much with what I could photograph um, until like with Aaron a shooting occurred and then uh, um, then I didn't take any photographs uh, not because I was told not to but it, I was given free rein by the Canadians to photograph anything to do with Canada's involvement there's 11 different nations on the base um, the MFO don't allow journalists or the media onto their base so I felt that it was a, a high degree of trust and privilege that I'd been afforded so a lot of my work you'll see here relates more to the notion of absence than presence. So how do you make your presence present in your absence is something that I deal with a lot in my work. This is called retired observation posts. The idea of standing down the guard would be um, a concept running in this piece here. These water meters are peppered around the, uh, the base and the region. The Israelis did put in a reverse osmosis treatment plant, hence you can see the irrigation. This is the former Israeli air base that the MFO now occupies, so there was some greenery, but by and large, water as a commodity really uh, became very apparent to me as something of, of great importance within the region. The idea that the condition of normalcy is to conserve water really struck me very hard. This piece is called Well. It's a water cache, bottled water being a, a primary currency. You see kids begging for uh, bottled water in the local towns and villages when I was traveling through by taxi. The mantra for the MFO is observe, report, verify. That's kind of like peacekeeper's mantra, that you look at what's going on, you report any um, potential transgressions, and then uh, they will be verified by the liaison. I thought that was part of this nomenclature, but actually this was a sign for the cinema on the base. This was the movies that they were showing at the time, and we have a Canadian uh, um, personnel walking right by there. Liberty Avenue. I think that the idea of peacekeeping should be seen as a thoroughfare that's open at both ends, something that we can travel quite freely. This is the street on which the Canadian mess, the Beaver Lodge, affectionately named, is located. And uh, I asked the officer driving me to the Beaver Lodge uh, what he thought of uh, having his mess located on a street with this name. And he had not noticed the street sign. So you got seven square kilometers fenced in. These people don't go anywhere for months at a time, but he'd not noticed the name of the street. Here I am now having traveled north and west of the border into the occupied territories in the West Bank. This piece is called Lookout. The graffiti is actually in Hebrew, it's a vanu, and it means uh, crossing over or passing over. This piece I call the August 2009 War Panorama. So it benchmarks that first image that I showed you from the October 1973 War Panorama with the missile in front of the building in Cairo. Here we have the Israeli security fence running just um, south of uh, the Palestinian town of Anata. And in the foreground, I want your attention to be on the small shanty buildings. That's a Bedouin encampment. And um, they'd be using Anata to access uh, for, for water and food. And clearly once this gap in the wall is closed and the idea of these boundaries uh, coming up um, is going to be a, a problem there. 